the stories were true. The king is born. The messengers have scattered into the darkest streets. With lamps held high to broadcast the news, the season of mercy has begun. One and all, come and take this gift. God is not counting our sins against us. Receive the Savior, born and died and alive again. His life for yours, your life unending. Christmas is the first line of an invitation. Not to be perfect, not to try harder, not to get it right this time but to believe and be counted among those who rest in his hands. We have not come to tell the world to do better. We sing instead of the depth of our sin and of amazing grace that runs deeper still. The stories were true. The mystery is revealed. Mercy for sinners. The Savior is born. Good morning and welcome to Birmingham First Church of the Nazarene. I'm Pastor Huey Davis. Good to see you here. Good to know that you're watching on this fourth Sunday of Advent. And we've been lighting our candle and counting down to the this very day. Uh, the first candle we lit way back almost a month ago was uh, the candle of Christ our hope. The next week it was Christ the way. And then last week we lit the uh, pink candle, a symbol of Christ our joy. And today, the fourth week of Advent, we light this final candle, <clears throat> and it symbolizes Christ our peace. So let's light the candles this morning. Reading from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Let us pray this morning together. Lord God, we light this candle to thank you for your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. We who live in discord and strife have found peace in the promise of eternal life through Jesus. We give you thanks and praise in his name because he lives and reigns with you in your glory and in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Come now, Father, we give you permission to speak to our hearts, to our lives, to our situations. We lay our lives before you and ask that you would speak to us this morning. Watch over those and care for those who are online watching this morning. And bless every person here, we ask, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Let's continue to worship him this morning.
Well, we're so glad that y'all are here this morning. Good to know you're watching online. Merry Christmas from the Davises. Merry Christmas. I hope you have a great Christmas Eve and a great day tomorrow. I've told several people, the guy called, and I have to be honest when he says, how have they been this year? You know, as a pastor, I'm a subcontractor to Santa and all that he does. And some of y'all are going to have a great Christmas. Some of y'all, there's always next year. I did what I could, and that's all I can do. But we are so glad that you're here this morning and uh, excited about what the day holds for us, uh, excited what the Lord has for us as we come down now to the fourth Sunday of Advent. We've really been spending it well, I think. The first Sunday of Advent, <clears throat> we talked about hope, but not the hope like, I hope I get something for Christmas, the hope that says it's based on the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, well, his birth, 
his life, his death, and him being raised from the dead. It's a living hope. It's an actual hope. And our hope is based on trust and faith. And our hope is guaranteed by faith, faith in what Jesus has done for us. The second Sunday of Advent, we talked about love. God's love for us. Before we loved him, before we knew we needed a Savior, he sent his son to die for us. So our response to God and his love is to love him in return. We discover from God's Word that to love is to obey. And this love drives us to love others by sharing what God has done for us. Then last Sunday, we talked about joy. And joy is being right with God, which is not an easy concept to understand. But joy, the joy we have is a joy that means we have become right with God. And we said there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is based on circumstances, but joy is based on Jesus. Now, this brings us to the last Sunday of Advent. And we're going to talk about joy. And just succinctly, joy is being right with God. It's uh, the culmination of hope, of our hope, of God's love and our love culmination of all the joy that we have because of being right with God, we have peace. Peace. The Prince of Peace. In John chapter 14, verses 25 through 27, Jesus is very near the cross, and he's talking to the kids one last time, and he's talking to them personally, and it's just the uh, 11, and he's talking to them in such a way that he wants them to know. Actually, it's the 12. He's he's talking to them in such a way that he's trying to convey to them in these final words the urgency of the moment and the importance of what's going to happen in the next hours. And he says in verse 25, All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Now, Jesus hasn't been talking about peace in the verses leading up to this. Jesus has been talking about the Holy Spirit, the Counselor, the one who will come after him. And the, the kids aren't understanding this. The, the disciples aren't understanding this. What do you mean when you leave? Why would you be leaving? And Jesus says, when I leave, the counselor will come. He's been talking about the Holy Spirit. And he is telling us that it is the Holy Spirit living inside of us that will bring us this peace. He says, peace, I leave you. Peace. I give you. And then those two phrases that are very, very important. He says, do not be troubled and do not be afraid. Do you know how many times in the New Testament that phrase, do not be afraid, is used? Every time an angel shows up somewhere, they're always saying, hey, don't be afraid. Yeah, I know I'm looking pretty good, all powerful. You know, and so what color robes do the angels wear? Yeah, you don't know. You weren't there. Well, there are a couple of you could have been there, but I'm just saying that most of us have never seen an angel, but we think they're, you know, have that white robe on, maybe a burning sword. But apparently whatever they looked like, when they showed up, people were like, oh. And the angel's first word, do not be as scared. That's in the Alabama translation. Do not be troubled, Jesus said. Do not be afraid. And this peace that Jesus leaves to them where they will not be troubled and they will not be afraid. This is the most sought-out peace, and it's an inward peace. (coughs) Excuse me. It is a peace of mind or a peace in the heart. Now, when I say peace of mind, that's not I-E, okay? That's E-A. Because sometimes your mother said to you, I'm going to give you a peace of my mind, and you said, well, maybe you didn't say this. I might have said this. 
I don't remember. But I might have said, I'm not sure you have any left to give. I did not say that out loud, because I may be good looking, but I'm not stupid. Jesus is saying, this peace of mind, EA, or this peace of heart, this is a peace that gives freedom from hostility, freedom from guilt and anxiety. It is an over overwhelming sense of personal well being. This peace is the promise of Jesus to us. You know this about Jesus? He keeps his promises, right? That's what we know. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul writes about this. He's talking about the, the fruit of the Spirit, and this is what he says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and today's topic, it is also peace. This peace is experienced by spirit-filled believers because it is a spiritual peace, not an environmental peace. It's not a peace where you go somewhere. I've heard people say, you know, I just feel so peaceful and at ease when the kids have finally gone down, the grandkids have gone home, when I've had a good meal and there's a good game on the television. And that's just a peaceful, that's not the peace we're talking about. That's environmental peace. It's based on some would say it's based on a lack of conflict or a lack of uh, anxiety about what's going on in the chaotic world that we live in. It's a spiritual peace. An environmental peace is an outward one. The world wants an end to cold wars and hot wars. They want a calmness in their neighborhoods and in their cities. They want a world without conflict. And I doubt that we'll ever know a peace like what this is talking about before the reign of Jesus is fulfilled when he comes. It's just not going to happen. Jesus gives peace of mind. And this is why we can have peace in the midst of chaos. That's why we can rest comfortably, sleep thoroughly, because we know that God is in control. He's handed the kingdoms of the world to his son, and at some point, he's coming back for us, and everything is going to be all right because he's the Prince of Peace. The requirements for peace are not freedom from economic necessity or freedom from pain or even perfect relationships with people. The one absolute requirement for peace of mind is righteousness. And righteousness, break it down, righteousness is being right with God, which is an unbelievable concept that we, as we are, forgiven, filled with God's Holy Spirit, can stand in God's presence and not be scared. That we can stand in God's presence and he, you know, God would look to his son and says, who's this? And he says, Jesus would say, oh, he's one of us. He would call us by name. He's one of us. He belongs to me. Check the book. His name, her name, is written down in that book, the book of life. And so even though we have a past, and we all have a past, coming to Christ and being forgiven forgives that past. And we have a brand new start with God. And we can stand in his presence without fear, without being afraid. In Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have been justified through faith, and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have this peace. Not a peace that we're not going to have war, or, or not this peace that the world's not going to be in chaos, not even that my relationships may not be in conflict, but we have the peace 
that allows us to stand in the presence of God. It's an amazing piece. Not something we can cover in an entirety on one Sunday morning. But there is this peace that he offers to us. And peace with God is much more than a personal feeling or the absence of a sense of condemnation. That we can stand in God's presence with a peace knowing that we are not going to be judged against us. But we're going to be judged as one of his children. In other words, whenever there's judgment, there's a good and a bad, right? If you're in a court case and someone has, is suing you, you're seeking a judgment because you're innocent, you didn't do what they're saying, and they have no right to sue you. You want a judgment, that judge, and that judgment falls on your side. We so often think that judgment is only negative, that it's only God talking about our sin. But when you stand in front of him and your name's in the book of life and your, his son says, yeah, that's one of mine, the judgment is going to be in your favor. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's coming with us. I've got a place for him, Jesus says. I've been working on it day and night. That's what he said he'd be doing. I have this on good authority. He's going to put the Nazarenes in charge of the buffet, and I'm very excited about that. I've got some Baptist friends that argue with me, but I'm just saying, listen. So we will have peace with God. Stand in His presence. So it's much more than just a, a touchy-feely kind of thing or the absence of a sense of judgment. It is truly being right with God and totally at peace with Him. Now, to obtain this peace requires some stuff. First... It requires repentance. We must stop our disobedience. We must truly change our living. Not planning on changing, but actually changing. You know, sometimes you, God says, hey, I, I just want to talk to you about this thing. And you say, oh, yeah, yeah, we need to talk about that. I've been meaning to talk to you about that. You've been doing this, and I need you to stop doing this. You know, Lord, I was planning on changing that myself. I'm going to need some time. Could I have a decade? Because, I mean, I'm working on this, like, really, really hard, but I think this is something that's going to take some time. And God says, no, what I need you to do is this instant. Stop that. True repentance is being obedient. Obedience is how we show that we love God. We must actually change. As we come to Christ and he forgives us, repentance is turning away from the former life and living a new life. Some would say, well, you can do both. And actually, you can't. It's either or, one or the other. We've got to have repentance in our life. And then, to obtain this peace we're talking about requires obedience. Having turned from sin, we now turn to obedience. We now do what His Word says. We study His Word that we might find what He expects of us. And the, the, people try to get negative here and say, well, he's just a bunch, it's just a bunch of rules and stuff. But I understand this. Every time God's word has spoken about something, it was always for my betterment. That my life would be better. That my world would be better. That my future would be better. Do you know why? Because he actually knows what he's doing. There have been plenty of times I pointed out to some stuff he ought to change and ought to do, and he just responds so nicely to me. Yeah, I'll think about that. That's, you, know, I, you know, I'll put that in the hopper. I'll ask Gabriel about that. No, he doesn't say that. God knows what he's doing. And we can trust him to do what he says he will do. I also understand that when I pray, God's word makes more sense to me and it speaks to me louder. And prayer is not some 20, 30, an hour and a half time of just bringing stuff up. It's not a grocery list. But it's praying the prayer like Jesus taught us to pray. There's some praise, there's some requests, uh, there's some um, moments when we say, not my will, but your will be done, and there's some thanksgiving in there as well. We can live obedient lives when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. He doesn't expect us to do it on our own. He has sent the counselor that we might be filled with the Holy Spirit and live a life that's not only pleasing to God, but is attractive to the world. Well, how do you maintain this peace? Well, first, there's faith, which really is belief and trust. I don't know how many times 
that I have turned on the lights in my office? And do I ever think, well, here's what has to happen. It's a thing between amperage and voltage. And the substation has connected to the main transmission lines that is connected to the dynamos at that place where they're generating power, usually by water running over some turbines. Did you understand any of that? I didn't. I just made most of that up. But I'm just saying, you know, I never sit there and think, well, I sure hope that breaker's on. This week, my um, heater stopped working. And I did the only thing I need to do, uh, needed to do, and I, I called Jeff Burleson and said, hey, Jeff, fix this. You know, semi-genius. Yeah. But, he, but you know, I said, but let me, let me work on it. You know how I worked on it? I went and got both heaters out of uh, this room over here, and I, I put them in my office and turned them both on because I'm, I'm fairly bright. Until they both broke the breaker, and they both turned off, and my room started getting cold again, and then I had to go look for the breaker box. I don't want to dwell into it, but it all turned out well, okay? But when I flipped that light switch... The power comes on. That's trust and faith in electricity. Boy, if we could just apply that faith and trust to God. Got to have faith. We also need obedience. We've talked about that's doing the godly and not doing the ungodly. If you're having, struggling there, having questions there, he will convey to you which one you're doing. I'm sure of this. And then there's meekness. And meekness is correctly understanding our relationship with God. I understand that I am creature, created, and He is creator. That I am dependent upon Him. Well, that's how you maintain it. How do you destroy it? Well, you just need to express pride. That'll destroy peace. Pride, that, another word for that is conceited, which is excessively high opinion of oneself or ability. You can express self-willfulness, which is putting our will before God's will. Oh, that's a good plan, Lord, but I've got one too, and I'd like to try mine first. You know what God says to that? Have at it. Take off. Go to town. Get started. Woo-hoo. Because he knows his plan is so infinitely better than yours that when you get frustrated and come to your senses, that he'll be there going, hey, I love you. Let's try my way. Or uh, something else that'll kill it is self-importance. That I am more important than others. Recently in my car, I have come to just say, the reason that person is not going when the light turns green is because they're on an important phone call. And I don't know, maybe they're talking to the president or an ambassador. Maybe they're talking to the governor. Maybe it's a million dollar, billion dollar uh, project they're working on and they need to talk to that person right now. Because you know what? They're just more important than I am. At some point, Nancy will turn to me and say, sarcasm, right? And I'll say, yes, that was sarcasm. Now, the trouble comes when we strive to have the peace of Jesus, EA, the peace of Jesus, while hanging on to a peace, i.e., a peace of the world. We want both. We want to have a peace of the world, and we want to have the peace of Jesus in our hearts. And they are incompatible. They don't go together. Not, you cannot have his peace and be at peace with the world. Because if you have his peace, the world will notice. And they will do what they can to try to destroy your peace. That's our trouble. So often we trade a false peace for a true peace. We think that the false peace will be satisfying. And it may be for a while. It may take time. But eventually we discover that false peace is no peace. Also, peace does not mean that we stop fighting evil. The peace of God requires that we fight sin and evil at every turn. Well, if we're going to just be at peace, that means we just get along with everybody and we never confront anything, and that's not what the Bible says. I'll give you an example. Holiness may demand the abandonment of peace on one level in order to preserve it on a deeper level. And I kind of... You know, I read that and I kind of said, well, I don't, uh, is there a good example of that? Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making his peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus, who has perfect peace with the Father, 
allowed himself to go to the cross so that he might destroy sin and death. He gave away what we consider peace so that he might obtain a higher victory for us. Jesus offers us peace. He gives us peace. But the thing is, we have to accept his peace. It's not an automatic thing. You have to make that choice. And this celebration of Christmas is the celebration of being right with God. You think of all the things we have looked at. It's simply being right with God. Something that should be unattainable to us. But through his love and grace, his mercy, sending his son to die for us, we can be right with God. We can be at peace with God. We can have hope. We can know his love and have love for others. And we, we have a, a living hope. And we have joy. We experience his love and we love him in return. That's the hope that we have. And this, this hope and love brings us joy. And this hope, love, and joy bring peace because we have the opportunity to be right with God. We have the opportunity to be right with God. To stand in his presence. Not feel shame. Not feel guilt. But this morning, if you're trying to balance the world's peace and, your, and God's peace, it's going to be a bad day. It's going to be a bad life. You're going to have to choose one or the other. And the thing about God is, he allows us to choose not him. So you need to make that choice for him. This morning, we're going to work towards our time of prayer. We're going to sing a little bit. But we have a place in our church we use. It's called the altar. We use it to dedicate children. We use it to, to pray. We use it for people to confess Christ. A lot of things. And there'll be a lot of reasons that people come to the altar and pray. And all of them are appropriate. But this morning... If you don't have peace with God, I want you to know that he's offering you peace with God. You don't have to begging for it. You don't have to go looking for it. He's offering it to you. His hand is held out that you might take it and become his child by accepting Christ as his Savior. And if you'd like to do that this morning, it's appropriate. And we would love to see you do that. There's other reasons people we're praying for. Things we're praying for. But as we sing, may your heart think on these things. And may the Lord bless you as the Spirit speaks to you.
Father, we praise your holy name. We give you glory, Lord God, for this Advent season. Father, we rejoice in the birth of our Savior. We're reminded again that we can have a right relationship with you because of what your Son has done for us. Don't deserve it, can't earn it, but Father, your love is so great that your mercy and forgiveness would just flow to us and all that would accept it. Father, there are people here today that are wondering about all this, not sure, but I pray that you'd speak to their hearts. Draw them closer to you this morning, we pray. Father, there are others that have heard and they're ready to pray. That's what they want to do this morning. They want for Christmas the gift of life. If you'd like to accept Christ as your Savior this morning, just pray this in your heart silently. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your Son. I need a Savior, Father, because I've sinned. I believe that your Son has come that I might be forgiven. And I ask for your forgiveness. Father, such a simple prayer, but such eternal rewards. And I pray that you'd be with those that prayed that prayer. Maybe they've prayed it before. But Father, this time, they're going to tell somebody. They're going to mention it to a leader, to a friend, to a spouse, to a pastor. Father, we pray that you'd be upon them and this new life, that you'd begin to open their lives to the word and to prayer. Father, for all of us, that we would just be reminded again that we are right with you because of your Son. Allow us to know that in its fullness in these Christmas days. Father, we ask that you would uh, make us a people of peace, a people of joy, a people of love and hope, that we would live in such a way that those people around us would ask about the hope that is within us. Father, continue to make this a place of forgiveness, a place of freedom, and a, a place of family. We ask that you would be with those who are watching online, that you would speak to them and they would sense your love and care in these moments. Father, we have some that are sick and homebound and we pray that they would sense your presence, that you would provide for their needs. You'd speak to their health issues. You'd be with those who are recovering from illness and surgery. We pray that you'd be with those who are facing adversity, those that are facing and struggling with temptation, that you would give them strength, that you would be their shield, that you would lead them not into temptation. <coughs> Father, we pray that your watch care over your campus here and your people. Father, help us share our faith with those around us this week. Father, we thank you for tomorrow. We pray that it be a great day for everybody that's gathered. And that in the midst of all that, we would understand again the peace that we have with you. Lord Jesus, we pray this in your name. And we pray for your coming. Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen and amen. Let me tell you what's going on. Uh, if you need to get a hold of me, there are my numbers. The first one is the office number. The second one is my personal cell phone. If you need to get a hold of me, give those things a call. Um, I want to thank you for your offering. The offering plates in the back. Gifts that you give to our church. Your tithing makes a difference. It matters. We appreciate it. There's several ways that you can uh, give to this local church. Uh, there will be Tuesday night gym night for those that absolutely have to play pickleball. If you have to play pickleball, it's in your blood, you have to play, you can come play. Um, if you don't have to play, stay at home and enjoy your Christmas stories. Uh, we won't have kids with us, friends with us on Tuesday night, but we invite you to come and be a part of that. Today... Exciting news. There are Christmas treats. By a show of hands, how many people came just for the Christmas treats? Is there anybody other than me? 
Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Christmas tree out there. There's a bag for everybody. And then also, while you're out there getting your bag, you can uh, stand by the Christmas tree, and my wife, Nancy, will be taking pictures. And sometime um, later on, she'll be sending those out by email. Excuse me, I asked for an hour. I asked the Lord if I could have an hour without coughing. And I, I should have asked for 90 minutes, so I apologize. And one of the things I'd like to do today, Nancy, could you come here, please? Nancy Davis? Nancy Davis, could you come here, please? Nancy Davis, to the front of the church, please. Nancy Davis. So, this week, <coughs> excuse me, this week Nancy and I celebrate 40 years of ministry. 40 years. She started when she was like 10. I was much older. So, 40 years. And I was thinking about it the other day, and for 40 years, 43 years actually, because we, the first thing we did together in ministry is we taught children's church at Grandview Church in Nazarene in uh, Grandview. Kansas City, Missouri. I Kansas, uh, Gray, uh, Grandview. So, in Grandview, Missouri, we taught the little kids. Now, what was wild about this is many of the seminary professors had their kids that were in that thing. And I mean, like, you'd, you'd ask, they'd ask questions, you'd be, going, you'd be going like, hey, what do we, let's play a game now. Let's play a game. Because they, you know, they would talk, they would play, they would talk to their parents, and they had these questions, you'd be like, I have no idea what they're talking about. And then, uh, as I went through it, either together or separately, every age level, Babies, toddlers, preteens, teenagers, and that includes camps and quizzing and caravans and all those things, all the way up to young marrieds and then all the way up to senior adults. Nancy has been a part of that, uh, and we are just blessed to have her as our uh, pastor's wife, first lady, my wife. And I just wanted to thank her today, uh, and I don't do it enough, and I want to do that. And I have uh, flowers for you. You do? I do. Ruben Savoy. Ruben Savoy to the front. Here he comes. <laughs> I was just talking with Ruben. No, he's Do you know anything about that? Aw, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So we present these to your church family and your pastor present these. We want to thank you for thank you. all that you do. All right, thank, thank you. you. Now, if you'll go take your position. Thank you, Reuben. Uh, uh, well, we're gonna, we got a couple of things we still have to do, if that's okay. So, this morning, let's proclaim what we believe by reading together the Apostles' Creed. Ready? Read with me. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church of Jesus Christ, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hey, we just wish you a Merry Christmas. We hope you have just a great time. Uh, with family or friends, and we want to thank everybody that's here today, those that are watching. It's good to have family and friends with us, and uh, we just pray the Lord's blessing upon you. Receive this benediction, and then you'll line up in a very uh, orderly manner. No pushing and shoving. It'll be Christmas treat, pictures. Please exit the building. <laughs> Father, I thank you for this wonderful group of people, those that are watching online. 
I thank you for family and friends that come to worship with us. We pray your blessing upon them. Father, we ask now that you would send us from this place with your love so heavy on our hearts that we couldn't help but share it with others. We celebrate tonight, we celebrate tomorrow, and we ask the Lord God that you'd be with us as we do that. We love you and we thank you. Now send us in your peace, we pray, Lord Jesus, and we ask these things in your name. God bless you, and you're dismissed to love and serve our risen King.